Uh, this is Rex Tester. I think it's more nicely formatted than .NET Fiddle because it doesn't have any adverts, so I'll be using that from now on. Okay, some more people have joined us, that's good. Still not zero, though. Okay, so, int i equals zero while i is less than or equal to three. Okay, so, um, this tells us that the loop starts at zero, okay, as we just discussed. Loop starts at zero, okay? Right, so this is the first important part. Okay, and we called this, hopefully you guys remember what this is called, this is called the loop initialization, right? And you, I mean, it's, it's not a scary word, right? The word initial here tells you why it's called this, right? It's the initial point of the loop, okay? This tells us for what values will this loop run? Okay, or um, another way of saying the same thing is, is to say, where will this loop stop? That's what this line is telling us. Okay, and hopefully you guys remember we called this the loop condition. Okay, so what do we mean by that? So here our loop starts at zero, right, int i equals zero, zero, one, two, three. Okay, it runs while i is less than or equal to three. Okay, in the loop we print out the value of i. Okay, on that line, console.writeLine i, and then we add one to i. Okay, so this will show us what values of i the loop is running for, right? So we start at zero, we run while i is less than or equal to three. So what values do we expect for i if we're adding one each time? Of course, we expect 0, 1, 2, 3, right? These are all the numbers from 0 to, well, just all of the numbers greater than 0, right, where we start, that are less than or equal to 3, right? So they're all the numbers that satisfy our condition. That's all this is doing, right? And then there's this line, okay? This is telling us how much, or rather, how do we get from start to end, okay? So this is tr saying, how do I get from this int i equals zero to the point where i is equal to three, right? Because this, um, or when i is even greater than three, right? So like, how do I get to my start, from my starting condition, from my starting point, i equals zero, to my stopping point, i less than or equal to three. How do I get from that? Get from zero to three, basically. And this is saying, oh, okay, I add one to i each time, okay? So if I added three to i each time, still quite simple, right? We would say, okay, the loop runs on zero because it starts at zero, okay? And zero is less than or equal to three. We then print out i, i's value is 0 initially, we then add 3 to i, which gives us 3, okay, we're now at the end of the while loop, so we go back to the beginning, and we see, okay, what is i's value now, well, we just added 3 to it, it started at 0, so it's now 3, is 3 less than or equal to 3, yes, okay, so we run again, and i will be printed out, i's value is 3, so this loop, what would it do? It will just print out 0, 3. Okay? If I added 2, you can follow a very sim similar logic, right? 0 is less than or equal to 3. 2 is less than or equal to 3. 4 is not less than or equal to 3. So this will just print out 0, 2. Okay? So all the only question we have to ask with the while loop, and hopefully you guys got this in the last lesson and maybe even before that, the only question we have to ask is what values of i, okay, what values of i will our condition be true? For what values of i will our condition be true? Okay, that's the only thing we have to answer. And then, from then on, to understand the loop fully, you could just explore what is this increment. But currently, you guys have only seen increments of one. Okay, so we're just adding one each time. So, we're just asking the question, for what values will this condition, i less than or equal to 3, be true, okay? 
Very simple to understand a while loop. Hopefully you guys are all comfortable with these by now. Okay. A for loop is identical. Okay. It is basically identical. The only thing that changes is where you write these things. Okay. So you see we have this, the initialization. We have the condition. We have the increment. Okay. The only thing that changes to a for loop literally all for loops can be rewritten as while loops all of them the only thing that changes about a for loop is how we write them okay the logic doesn't change at all if you understand the logic of a while loop then you understand the logic of a for loop okay because look this is the increments all right i mean the sorry initialization that was silly of me the initialization right where we start. This is the condition where we stop. This is the increment, okay, how we get from our initial point to our condition being false. Okay. So all we do in a for loop is rewrite these three things. Okay. That's that's it. They, they it's exactly the same. Okay, translating this into a for loop. All I do is take this code and I take it exactly like I'll literally I'm going to control I'm going to control C okay just copy it okay I'll or I'll even cut it so that we remove the while loop okay so I'll control X so I'm copying that exact same code all I do is put a chair okay so now the initialization is inside the for loop okay I then just um, cut this code okay cut and paste this code and I put it right there. Yeah, I put it right there. There's the condition. I then just cut and paste this code exactly. Okay, and um, and that's my that's my increment. This for loop is now doing the exact same thing as our while loop was doing. Okay, there is no difference. The logic is exactly the same. It starts at zero. It runs while i is less than or equal to three, and we add one to i each time it loops. Okay, console console dot right line i. Okay, this will do the exact same thing. Okay, when we printed out zero two, all we changed was that this was two. So this would say zero two. If we make it plus one, then it'll say zero one two three. Okay, it's identical. If you understand the logic of a while loop, even one way of approaching this, if you want it, if you feel more comfortable with while loops, is to just translate the for loop into a while loop. Okay, because you can do that. The, the only thing that changes is how you're writing it. The logic does not change at all. It's literally writing the same thing in a different way. It's kind of like the difference between I am and I'm, right? It's like you're writing the exact same thing just in a different way. It doesn't require any different... You don't have to think about it um, in a different way. The logic is identical. Okay. So everything we've said about while loops also applies to for loops. It's just that we write them differently. Okay. We put the, all the things that are important to the loop in the same place. Okay. Cool. So with that discussed, so we fully revised repetition structures, which was requested at the end of the last um, lesson. Should I link you, Saham, to this one? Because it is better than .NET Fiddle, hey? Um, I'll just link it to you. Hmm. So, um, yeah. Uh, this one, if too many people use it, it does break, unfortunately. I don't think they have a lot of server space and stuff. But it's okay. Um, so, let's, let's now move on to section two. This is the, that's the end of section one for us. We've done two tests on it now. Um, yeah, some of you did okay. Others struggled, but that's why we did that whole revision lecture last week. I noticed that I didn't post the YouTube video of it. The video does have views though, so I guess some of you still managed to find it. But I will post the YouTube video of last week's lecture when I post this one, okay, as well. So in this lecture, 
we are going to begin discussing object-oriented programming. Okay, um, so this is like an introduction to section two. All right. Before we do that, I want to revise one more concept from chapter one because it has been a while since we've worked with them. Okay, it's a concept that we touched on while we were studying recursion. So this idea where methods call themselves, and that is the idea of a method. Okay, I want to revise the concept of a method. What is a method doing? What are the primary words inside a method? And then we're going to start discussing um, um, object-oriented programming. Okay, which basically, um, for a, for an overview of what you're doing with object-oriented programming, is it's just a way of organizing code. Okay, so. It's, it's just a way of organizing your code in a nice, readable, um, and also just more efficient way. So you have to write less and things like that. Um, cool. But what we want to revise is methods. Okay. So there's one method that we've worked with a lot um, since the beginning of the course. And hopefully by now we know this is the main method. Okay. This, this method here that's in all of our C-sharp programs is the main method. Okay, the function of the main method is it's just the place that the computer goes when it wants to run your code for the first time. So when the computer just starts running your code, it looks for a main method. If there's no main method, then it won't know what to run. Okay, so we'll always have a main method and it's the first method that, um, that C-sharp will try to run that your computer will try to run. So we've worked with it a lot and to work with the main method you just put your code here, right? You just put your code here. So for example I could say um, console.writeLine okay and let's just print out a little message. So I'm gonna say I am in the main method, okay? So I'm just printing out, I am in the main method. Okay, so when I run this, you see it just prints out, I am in the main method. Okay. Now, obviously, when you're writing large programs, it's not really, um, it's not easily readable to put all of your code in one method. So you can kind of visualize that already Right, if we're doing a lot of different operations, like if we have some very complex code, um, very complex code, and you know, we so we do a bunch of stuff that takes up, let's say, 50 lines, okay, 50 lines of code, and then we say, oh, damn, um, I, ha I actually have to do some more stuff, so we say, more co very complex code, more complex code, okay, and cool we finish all of that and we go oh actually you know I need to add this other feature still so we go and we add even more complex code okay and you can see this would get right if this was 50 lines of code and this was 50 lines of code and this was another 50 lines this would be really annoying to read through right um, yeah kind of like you wouldn't want a book like with everything on one page, you know, a textbook that's just one long page would be a nightmare to go through something like that, right? You, you would prefer to have things organized into sections and chapters and just so that it's more easy to read and so that you can segment things out logically, right? You want to split your ideas into paragraphs. Some, that's a very good um, way of thinking about it. You want to split these ideas into related paragraphs, right? I don't want some code for, like, let's say my system needs a calculator, right? And I put my calculator code here, and then over here I put um, some code for for the keyboard, okay? And here I put code for um, visualizing, okay? You wouldn't want this all in one method, right? Because these things aren't related. So ideally, when I create a method, I want all of the code to be related. Okay. Um, another good way of thinking about it is we have this flowchart structure, right? Some t uh, the flowchart will show sort of one flow of ideas, 
right? So maybe we'll have a flow chart to calculate a factorial, for example, okay? Um, when we create that flow chart, we have a specific problem in mind, right? If we were creating a calculator, um, then the calculating the factorial and addition and multiplication, all of these things would be just small parts of our calculator, right? The calculator has to do, be able to do all of these different things. Multiplication, addition, the factorials, division, all of these different problems it has to address. But you can see that they're all, they can all be split, right? They're all different problems. I wouldn't want to do them all in one place, okay? I'd like to go, okay, I have this particular problem, like I need to be able to add two numbers together. It's like, okay, I can, I can write some code to add two numbers together, and when I need it, I'll just go fetch it, okay? My calculator doesn't have to see it all the time in main method, okay? So this is why methods exist. They allow us to organize different um, parts of our code in a neat way, okay? So, um, yeah, so we've got this, we've got one method currently, and it says I am the main method, okay? I am in the main method. I have a print statement that tells me it's in the main method, okay? Let's create another method now. Okay, let's just create another one. So I'm going to say, okay, static and I'm just going to copy, in fact, I'll literally just copy the main method. So you'll see that all of these methods are the same. Okay, um, I'm going to remove this. So I've copied the main method. Okay, I'm removing that. We'll, I'll remind you what that, what that means later. Okay, so I've got this line here. Okay, so I've, I've now got an exact copy, copy of the main method. Okay, and I'm just going to call it obviously having two things with the name main, the computer's going to complain about that, right? So I'm going to say this is other method. Okay, other method. So I've now got two methods, right? The main method and the other method. Okay, other method. So I can say now here I'll go console.writeline other method. Oh, I'll, I'll, let's print out something sensible, sorry. So I'll say, I am in the other method, okay? I am in the other method. I guess it's more like other method method, you know what I mean? Because other method is its name, okay? So, cool. So what happens now? If I run this, what would happen? So we would go to main method, and we'll go console.writeline, I am in the main method, okay? Notice I never, in my main method, the method that is run first, I never actually mention other method, right? So the computer doesn't care about it and it won't run it. So when I run this, it just goes, I am in the main method, right? Exactly as normal. It just says, I am in the main method, okay? So it doesn't look at other method. Right? So what if I do want it to look at other method? I do want it to use this other method. So let's say I want to say, I want to print out I am in the main method. Okay, so it runs this line of code. And then I want it to print out I am in the other method. Method. Okay. So um, one way of doing this, right, would just be to take this exact line of code. Okay take this exact line of code, just copy it, and throw it down here, right? That would be one way of doing that. But you see, I've already written this code somewhere. So ideally, I would like to just be able to tell the computer, okay, there is some code that I've already written in this method called other method, and I just want you to go there and run that, okay? I don't want to have to rewrite it, I'm just going to tell you where it is, and you can just go look in this method. I'll give you its name, um, and you just go run that, okay? So let's do that. I'm just going to copy-paste other method's name with the two little brackets afterwards as well, and throw it down there, okay? So you see, now I'm just telling the computer, look, there's this method called other method. Just go there and run whatever code I've put there. And so it'll go, okay, I'll go find other method. 
it goes it looks it'll quickly find okay it's the it's here it is there it's that's its name okay it'll then look inside and go okay cool I'm just gonna console dot right line I am in the other method method so now when I run this it'll go okay it'll print out this line I am in the main method and then it'll go and look for other method and run whatever code is there so when I run this you see it prints out I am in the main method and then it prints out I am in the other method method okay and I could add another method right I could say um, I'll literally just again I'm just gonna copy paste other method okay bam exactly the same okay all I'll have to change is the name right what should I call this one um, we could get we could call it like other other method but that would be getting convoluted so I'm just gonna call this um, print method okay. print method okay and the print method is just gonna say I am in the print method method I am in the print method method okay now when I run this what would happen right it would do the exact same thing it did last time right because it just goes to main goes console dot right line I am in the main method it goes and looks for other method and then other method just prints out I am in the other method method okay it, it won't go and look at print method because we never told it to go and look at print method right if I did want it to print in print out print methods line hopefully you guys can see how easy that would be right I just copy the print methods name I just throw it down there and and now it'll print out I am I am in the main method it'll go look for other method it'll run this code I am in the other method okay then it will go back to main right so after it's finished running the other method um, method it goes it prints this out says I'm in the other method method it'll then go back to main right back here okay it's now run this line so it'll go and run this line and it'll go okay there's a method called the print method I must go find that method it goes it finds it and then it prints out this line okay and then it'll go back here again right and just to show you that it does go back both times here I'll just print out console.write line finished running exclamation points I am um, the main method okay so just to be particularly clear about it okay I am the main method and yeah I guess cool so when I run this now it'll go it prints out I am in the main method goes to the other method runs this Ooh, someone's got yeah I guess so maybe a ringtone I am in the other method method okay it goes to the print method I am in the print method method and then it goes back here and goes okay I'm finished running I'm in the main method okay so you see how it goes out and it goes to these other methods all right okay what would be um, another interesting way to do this right so here you see here I call the other method and then I call the print method okay but what I want you guys to see now is that all of these methods can do everything the main method can do okay so let me show you this I'll instead of calling print method here okay so you see I call print method here instead of doing that I'm gonna remove it there okay and inside the other method oh please turn off your put it on silence or something okay and I'll call it here okay so now let's see what will happen okay it'll print out this first line I am the main method okay now we'll say I am the main method okay it then goes it calls other method all right calls other method over here okay goes it runs this code says I am in the other method method okay but then the inside the other method we tell it to go to the print method okay so then the other method will go to the print method okay it'll print out I am in the print method method the print method will finish it'll go back to the other method um, here 
then the other method is finished, and then it'll come back here and say, I'm finished running. I am in the main method. I am the main method. Okay. See how that's working, hopefully? Okay. Now, so that's the concept of methods, right? We can have a whole bunch of different methods. Our methods can call each other, um, and basically we can do whatever we want. Okay, this is like a very powerful structure, and generally when you write code, you'll always write code with methods. Okay, so here we dealt with a very specific, very simple method. Okay, so here we said, all we did was we created methods that could print lines, right? So this method just said, I am the other method. Okay, right? So that's all the other method did. Okay, I am the other method. Okay, but obviously we can make these things do much more powerful things. Okay, so let's say instead of printing out, I am the other method, we got it to print out, um, I am, I am the other method followed by a number, for example, okay, to tell me which one of the other methods it is. So let's just experiment with this, okay, so um, how do I tell the other method what number it must print? So from main method, I want to say other method, give it a number, and it must print out that number basically. Okay, that's that's our intention now. So, how would I tell it what number to print? Hmm, okay, we have to tell it a number, okay, and numbers are stored in variables, right? So, I have to tell the other method that it must expect to receive a number, okay, and that's what these brackets are here for, okay? to tell it what variables to expect. So here I'll say int x. Okay. So, or even just int number. Okay. So now the other method expects to be given a number. Okay. So um, how we can see this, if I run this now, um, you'll see that it will break. See it says error says there is no argument that corresponds to the required formal parameter. It gives a horrible error. But the point is, what this error is about is it's saying, you've now told other method that you're going to give it a number. Okay? You've told other method that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be given a number. So you have to give it that number. So how do I give it this number? When main method calls other method, I just have to put a number here now. So I can say, for example, other method 5. Okay, other method 5. Now, now you'll see it won't complain. When I run this, it says I am the other method, like usual. Okay, the difference now is that it does have this number. It has 5. So I said other method 5, so then it called this. Okay, it called the other method, and it gave it 5, and the other method saved that number 5 in this variable called number. Okay, and, and we can use this. So I can say, um, I am the other method, number. Okay, um, if you give it this little thing, it's like a placeholder almost, that, you, that allows you to print out a variable. Um, that's all it is. It's just C Sharp's way of saying like, okay, I'm going to put number in that little place that you've given me. So it's going to replace this with number. Okay. So this will say, I am the other method number, and then it's going to print out the number you give it. Okay. So you'll see when I run this, I can s it'll say, I am the other method number five. Okay. I am the other method number five see that. And now if I change this number, so if I change that to a 1, next time I run it, it's going to print out, I am the other method number 1. And if I change this number to a 2, it's going to print out, I am the other method number 2. Okay. Let me just see, check the chat. Can you get me added, sir?
Hmm. Okay, so cool. Hopefully we're all following so far. We're going through this quite slowly, right? So now, how did I tell it to expect this number? I just specified that it's receiving a number here. Okay. And if I wanted it to receive another number, I could just tell it again. Ooh, 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 ooh. Okay, so, um, sorry about that background noise, guys. Okay, so, I am the other method number. Okay, so, you can specify, um, what did we change? Oh, right, yeah. So, we can specify that it's receiving more numbers, right? So, here it receives int number. If I change that, if I wanted to receive another number, I could say int number two for example okay now when I run this it expects me to give it two numbers and to give it the second number I could just say comma five for example right and now I could use both of those numbers here right if I made it print out number two instead of number one okay if I make a print out number you see it prints out I am the other method number three if I make a print out I am the other method with the variable number two, then it would print out five here. Okay. So whichever variables you give it, you can use inside the method. Okay. And they have the name that you specify here. Okay, so it's exactly like creating a normal variable, right? Exactly like that. So why is this so useful? Okay. So this is quite a simple example, but now when I want to print out this whole line, when I want to say I am the other method number m, mm, I don't have to rewrite this whole console.write line thing, right? I can just call other method with different numbers, right? And I can call other method again. And I can just give it any, any numbers that I want. So now um, we'll get three prints. It'll say, I am the other method number three, I am the other method number four, I am the other method number one. So when I run this, you can see it prints them all out in order. Which is quite cool, right? And you, and you can make these methods as complicated as you want them to be. Okay. So, let's... Um, cool. Let's see why, like another reason why this could be so powerful. So, um, I'll create that for loop. Um, that we saw earlier. Guys, please mute your microphones if you have background noise. Thank you. Okay, um, so for okay, for int i equals zero, i less than three, i plus plus, right? So here I've got a for loop. Okay, the exact same one that we saw. When will this run? Right, it starts at zero, int i equals zero. Okay, it runs while i is less than three. So why? when will i be less than three? Okay, it starts at zero. When will i be less than three? Zero, one, two. Okay, so this will run on zero, one, and two. And then it'll say, okay, i plus plus. So it goes up by one each time. So now, what if I said other method i? Okay. Then this will print out I am the other method number one. I am the other method num or I am the other method number zero. Sorry, because we start at zero. Right, if I want to start at one, I'd have to do that. Okay. So this will print out I am the other method number zero. I am the other method number one, and I am the other method number two. Okay. So when I run this, you see it goes I am the other method number zero. I am the other method number one. I'm the other method number two. Okay, so these methods are very useful. Okay, you can do really interesting things with them. Okay, very easily. Cool. So, what if now instead of just printing out I am the other method number whatever, I want the other method to tell the main method something. So, for example, I want the main method to be able to go, hmm, what is 
this number multiplied by itself, for example. So I want the main method to be able to go, okay, I have the number three, for example, I have some number, and I just want to multiply that number by itself. Okay, so what is this number squared? Okay, this is the question we want to ask now. And I want a method that can answer that question so that the main method can just um, give this other method as many of these different numbers as it wants and the, the other method will just square them. Okay, so we kind of know how we would do this, right? We already know how to give um, other method a number, right? We've, we can see here other method gets number, right? So when I call other method, right, it does on, on three, it gets, <coughs> sorry, I ah, must have some order. It gets the number three, saves it in this variable number, and then it prints out that number, basically. It says, I am the other method number, and prints out the number. Okay, so if I just wanted to print out the number, I could just remove all this other stuff and just print out number. So this method would just go ahead and when I run it, it goes three, um, if, if I gave it a different number, it will just print out that number. Right now it'll print out 4. If I gave it 20, it would print out 20. Okay. So how would I print out this number times itself? Well, I would just go number times number. Right, that's pretty easy. Right, this will just take the thing on the left and multiply it by the thing on the right. So then I'd get 20 times 20, or whatever number I give it times that number. So if I said 3, then bam, we've got 9. Okay? If I said 4, what is 4 times 4? It's 16, right? And we get 16. Okay? If I give it 2, then it'll give us 4. Okay, so this already works. But remember what I said. I don't want it to just print out this number. I want it to give it back. Okay? So I want main method to get this number. All right. So for example, I want to be able to go in main method, I want to be able to say int number equals three. Okay. And I want it to be able to take number, square it and save it in another integer called, let's say answer. Okay. And I want main method to print out answer. Okay. So kind of what I would want it to do is here I want to print it out I want it to print out answer okay and I want this so after answer I want to be able to go on um, number times number okay but I want this to run inside other method okay you guys following so if I say int number equals three int answer equals number times number, you can see that this will just print out the um, whatever number is, oh sorry I must, uh, sorry I was still calling other method, so let me say console.writeline answer, okay, you can see that this will just print out number times number, right, so as I run this you see it goes 9, if I give it 4, exactly like what was happening previously right but you see now it's not using other method I'm just saying number times number here but I want this operation to happen inside other method okay so how would I do that well you might say okay instead of printing it out here I'm just gonna say other method and inside other method I'm just gonna say number times number okay this won't work hopefully you can see that it wouldn't work because we need to tell other method what it's doing with this, right? So currently other method goes number times number, but it's not saved anywhere, it's not placed anywhere, it just happens, okay? For this, hopefully you guys remember it because we have seen it before, we have this word return, okay? Return. So now, instead of printing out number times number inside other method, we go number times number, and then we return that result to um, main. Okay, we return the result to main. 
All right. In order to do that, this this has to be saved somewhere. Okay, it has to be saved somewhere. All right. And as usual, when we save something, we need to tell C sharp what type it is. Okay. And this word void is currently doing that. Okay, so you can see, remember when I copy pasted the main method, we had this word void. Okay, what the word void means to C sharp, when we say void, we mean we are not returning anything. Okay, when we say void, C sharp goes, okay, in this method, you are not allowed to use the word return. When I call this method, I don't expect it to return anything. It must just run, like when other method was printing earlier. It just printed something and then stopped, okay? Because it was using the word void, okay? If I wanted to return something, I need to, instead of putting the word void, I need to tell C sharp what I am going to return, okay? Here, I am returning number times number. That's another number, right? I'm returning an integer. Okay, so instead of void, I just put int. Okay, whatever type I am returning. Okay, now instead of saying number times number here, I can say other method. And I'm going to just to get the point across, I'm going to rename this integer x. Okay, so I've got int x equals 4. I want to get whatever x times x is. Okay, x squared. I'm trying to say 4 times 4, and I'm trying to do that inside the other method. So I'll go answer equals other method, and the number I'm going to give it, because other method expects a number, right? It expects int number. I'm going to give it x. Okay, this is fine, right? x is an int. Okay, x is an int. And it's just going to, we know what the equals sign does. We discussed it in great detail last week. What will it do? It'll take the thing on the right. What is the thing on the right? Okay. The thing on the right is it goes, it goes to other method. Other method takes this, the value of this variable x and saves it in number. And then it returns number times number. Okay. So this other method just becomes x right, because x gets saved in number, it just becomes x times x, okay, and whatever I make x, this other method will always just turn into x times x, okay, and it takes that thing on the right and saves it in the thing on the left, answer, and then I print out answer, okay, so here I say int x equals 5, I say int answer equals other method on 5, Okay, x is 5 currently. Okay, so what does the computer do? It goes, it finds other method. Other method expects to be given a number. We did give it a number. We gave it 5. So it saves that number 5 inside number. And then it returns, gives back number times number, which is 5 times 5. So all of this just becomes, this other method x just becomes 25. Okay. That's saved inside answer, and then we'll print out answer, which is 25. So when I run this, we get 25, okay? And whatever I change this value to, it'll just give that back squared, okay? It's 36. If I make it 10, we get 100. If I make it 20, we get 400, etc. Okay, just square roots. I mean, powers, you know what I mean? Okay. So quite this is quite a simple method and this was just to remind you what these words mean okay so we'll say public we haven't explored what that means yet static we haven't explored what that means yet but then we have this this type okay it's either a type like all the types you know string or double or int or bool any any type okay we give it a type we give the method a name Okay. We tell the method what it what it should expect. Okay. And then we just give the method the code it must run. All right. So that's what all of these words mean. Okay. Public and static, we'll explore what they mean later.
okay but for now I just want you to know this part of the method I want you to know what this is doing okay that's that's what I want right now okay you must understand what this part of the method is specifying okay this is the name of the method this is all the variables it expects to receive and this is what it is giving back okay and if we want to give back nothing we say void if we want to return nothing another way of saying give back is to say return if we want to return nothing we say void okay cool so yeah that's a reintroduction to methods we did discuss all this when I'm um, learning about recursion but I think it's worth going over in detail how this sort of structure works okay so literally you, it just whatever code you give it here it will just replace with whatever's in the method okay cool so when we come back we're now going to start discussing um, classes okay I well just before the break I want to show you something quickly okay so remember back to the beginning of the course we said a class is a set okay or a collection of methods okay inside classes we have methods okay. hmm. so yeah we've got inside our class we've got a bunch of methods and properties and stuff like that okay so we're, we're going to discuss classes in great detail but just to show you that this is true you see here we're calling other method okay other method here it is okay this is equivalent to me saying program dot other method okay where does this program come from you see the name of my class here we've got public class program okay so if I say program, that's the name of my class, program dot other method, okay, you see it comes here, right? Other method, program dot other method. So we're looking for a method inside program and its name is other method, okay? To go even one step above this, what is the name of my namespace? You see I'm in the namespace Rex Tester inside Rex tester I have this class called program inside program I have the main method and I have other method okay I could say here Rex tester dot program dot other method okay so Rex tester dot program so inside the namespace Rex tester I'm looking for the class called program and inside the class called program I'm looking for the method called other method Rex tester dot program dot other method okay so C sharp did just write this for us it hid this from us okay it understood that when we just had other method it understood that this is what we were looking for but just to show you that this is what happen is what is happening if I run this you can see it works okay C sharp knows what this means it knows what Rex tester dot program dot other method is okay so it knows what it's looking at all right so now we're going to explore how can we create our own classes so we have this class called program but let's just say I want to make another one I want to make another class how would I do that okay how do I work within one class how how do methods work what do all these other words mean public and static and all of these types of things what even is a class okay like rarely what is a class trying to do that's what we're going to discuss when we come back okay so I think let's take a break um, we have been going pretty intensely so I think let's maybe do a bit more than a 10 minute break so can we come back at 5 past 3 okay so I'm gonna start again at 5 past 3 okay, and I won't be waiting at 5 past 3 All right okay cool I see 12 people are in the meeting now um, that's good that's a sort of our normal number I think that's two less than usual oh yeah at 4 Sorry, I can't join the call because I have a school Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. Uh, can you get me added, please? So uh, hopefully that's fixed. So how come is expected variable name? Oh, oh, right. So 
Um, the reason I just changed that to X, um, Sachin, is just because, sorry, I didn't see your um, question earlier, because I don't know why, Microsoft didn't ping me or anything. Um, so the reason I renamed it to X is just to show you that they don't have to have the same name. Okay, they just have to have the same type. Okay, so if so that that second name, the name number. Let me just do this. So guys, yeah, um, I'll just answer this question. So int number. Okay, see here. This is this is what you're asking about. So why is this number when I give it X? Okay. So the important thing here is that they're both integers. Okay. So here, other method expects an int, okay? But all variables have two things, right, such, and they have a name, okay? And they have a value, okay? So when I say other method, you need to expect this specific variable, okay? You need to expect this variable. It needs to have a place to save that variable, okay? So this is me creating a new variable, okay? So this could be number. I could also call this number and give it number. Okay. But this number, this variable, int number, this one, is inside the main method. Okay. This number is different. Okay. This is inside the other method. All right. So this number is not the same as this number, even though they have the same name. Okay. And so it, by calling this X, I was just trying to show you they don't have to have the same name, okay? When, so here, all other method expects is an int, and it just saves that integer into a thing called number, okay? I can give it any integer. I can give it X, but I can also just give it an integer directly. Um, but this integer can have any name I want, as long as it's an integer here, okay? So it just expects something of int type, and me saying number here is just telling it where it must save it. All right. Yeah, cool. That's good. All right. So yeah, guys, come back at five past three. Um, now it's just a nine minute break and we'll get cracking again. I'm going to just go have some water because my throat is getting a bit sore. See you guys in nine minutes, all right? hydrated is much better okay let me see so I don't know is Benele struggling to connect or Benele are you here are you in the meeting <coughs> no he's not
weird. I know why Teams works for some and not for others. Maybe we should switch to WebEx or maybe even Zoom. Is Zoom free now? Uh, it says he's leaving. Why is he leaving? Problem is, I thought Zoom you had to pay for. Is that not true? Okay, yeah, okay, then that won't work for us. But Cisco um, WebEx Meets is quite nice, so maybe we should try that out ne next week. It also handles scheduling better than Microsoft Teams does, because like Microsoft Teams, even if you schedule a meeting, um, it just like stops itself I mean it doesn't like add to your calendar automatically or anything like that so it's basically pointless let me try to see if they'll join again hmm okay Hmm. Not sure what's going on there. Weird. I don't know why Teams is so strange. 40 minutes. Hmm. I don't know. I, I thought my one friend was saying, because that's what I thought as well, but my one friend was saying that they relaxed it or something during the pandemic. Because um, he apparently with his friends played for like a whole 40 minutes. Although maybe one of the friends had a professional account. Okay, that would make sense. Ah, okay, that was probably why one of the friends actually had bought. Ah, okay, I take it that's Benele then. Benele, have you joined us? Are you here? Looks like you are. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so we'll get cracking again in three minutes. Um, so, Benelli, we were just revising methods and stuff. Um, you can, I'll upload the YouTube video as usual, and you can watch that. I forgot to upload last week's one, so silly of me. It's because it's cause YouTube takes so long to process videos that are this length. I don't blame them, I mean, it is a two-hour video, so, <laughs> but, yeah. It's actually impressive that they allow me to upload this much for free, because I'm uploading six hours a week, and YouTube's just, they don't mind. Especially considering, like, each each video has, like, 12 views, <laughs> and yet YouTube allows this. Um, it's a very nice service, actually. Because you have to get, um, you guys wouldn't be able to even watch my team's videos, I think. Are you, yes, yeah, you're in. Okay, um, yeah, cool, we'll get started in two minutes again. So yeah, we're just going to be discussing what classes are, what object-oriented programming is, why it exists, all that kind of stuff. It is quite a nice topic, actually, it's quite interesting. It's very theoretical, though. Um, ooh, let me make sure you guys know where to follow along in your textbooks. Yeah, and make notes in your textbooks if there's things that you're not getting. I'm on the reef. Okay.
Okay, so yeah, object-oriented programming starts on chapter thirty and on page thirty-three, chapter thirty-three. Um, yeah. So we're just going to discuss the beginnings of this. We'll probably be going up to about page thirty-five before the end of the lesson. Um, so we'll get to understanding constructors. So just um, add a bunch of notes in your book. Feel free to scribble in it and stuff. So did you say we are discussing classes? Yeah, what classes are and what object-oriented programming is and why it exists. And it starts on 33, page 33 of your textbook, and you can make notes there. Um, but but before you joined, Benelli, we were discussing, we were revising methods. You should already know methods from the old recursion lectures. Um, so you should be okay, but maybe go back and watch the video if you get a bit lost. But yeah, on the first hour we were mostly just revising things. So we revised all the different repetition structures, well, for loops, and, and we revised methods. Okay, cool. It's five past three, so let's get started again. Um, Okay, so I have slides for this. So let me switch over to those. Okay, and yeah, I think we will switch to WebEx Meets for next week. So I'll send you the invite to that much earlier because fewer people seem to have problems with it. Some people have a problem and you'll have to create accounts and stuff, but but I think it usually works a bit better. Okay. Ooh. There is no good place to put this. I'll just put it at like the bottom there. Okay. All right. So um, we've we've got methods. Okay, we just revised methods. All right. Um, we we just revised methods. So let me make sure that didn't mean me here. Okay, we just revised methods. Um, so we have these words public and static. I just told you. Don't worry. We don't know what those mean yet. Um, but we'll explore them eventually. Okay, we then have a type, okay? So that type, the first type here, this can be replaced with, this can either be the word void, or it can be any of the types we know, okay? And the important thing is that this type must be the same as the thing after the word return, okay? It must have the same type as whatever this variable is, okay? So for example, we had number times number, okay? That was something of type int, right? That was something of type int, which means this type had to be int. Okay. Um, name, this was just the name of our method. Okay. Then inside these brackets, we could define variables that come into the method. Right. So previously we had int number. Okay. So that means it was taking in something called int and it was saving it in a variable with this name. Okay. And then if we have, if this type is not void, then we can have a return statement with something after it, and it will return that thing. Okay, it will give back that thing to whatever method called it. Right, so we just revised this now. Um, so hopefully most of you, if you did see the revision, are totally okay with what the structure is doing. Okay, methods are inside classes. Okay, and that's the, that's the thing we want to focus on more. So here I've got a little example. Um, so we have public class program. So we are in a class called program. All right. Um, public static void main. This is the method we always have. Right. We always have a method like this. Okay. Um, this is where our code starts running in the main method. Its name is main. You can see. Int x equals three. So I create a variable, its name is x, its value is initially 3, okay? We then say console.writeLine function x, okay? So function on this variable x, x is this, right? x is 3, okay? Function on x. So what does the computer do when it sees this? It sees function, normal brackets, x, normal brackets. What does it do? It knows that this must be a method. Okay, so it looks, it's inside class program, so it looks inside program for this, this method function, right? It has its name, it knows this method is called function. So it goes inside class program, it says main, main is the main method, it's not function, 
Okay, static int function. Okay, cool. This this is the method I'm looking for. Okay, function. It has the same name. Okay, function expects to receive int. Okay, it expects to receive something of type int. Okay, so I need to give it something of type int. So the computer will quickly make sure. What do I have? We gave it x, right? X is of type int. Okay. So cool, we're good. We can give it something of type int. I give it x. What does function do? It saves x inside whatever the name of that variable is here. It could have been x again. In this case, it's a. Okay, a. So function goes ahead. It saves the value of x, which is 3 inside a. Okay. Cool. What else does this declaration of function here immediately tell us? It also tells us this int, right? What does this int mean? This means that somewhere inside function, the computer doesn't know yet, but somewhere inside function, there is this word return. And after the return, there is something that can be saved in an integer. Okay, there is something of type int. So it immediately knows that this blue thing here, function x, okay, it will be replaced, function x is going to be replaced by an int. Okay. This type here is what will replace function x, okay, so something of type int. So, so um, we know that we're going to be printing out a number immediately. We don't yet know what that number is, but we know it's an int. Okay, we know that this thing we're printing out is an int. Function x is an int. Okay. So then we finally go inside function, okay. We've got this variable a, its value is 3, okay. And, and function just goes return, so it's just saying give back, right, a times a, okay, a times a, 3 times 3, that's just 9, right? So we say console.writeLine function x, function x just returns um, a, uh, a times a, okay, 3 times 3, and so this just becomes 9, so we've got console.writeLine 9, and this will just print out 9. That's all this code does. It prints out 9. Okay. So we've just got a method here that just multiplies a number by itself. That's all it does. You give it a number, it multiplies the number by itself, and it gives the result back to you. Okay, so if you give it 3, it'll give back 3 times 3, 9. If you give it 4, it'll give back 4 times 4, 16. Right? We just explored this example in detail. So this is a method called function, there's also a method called main, and they're inside a class called program. So we're going to be exploring this structure a little bit more. All right. Cool. Um, I'm just going to skip this. We know about recursion. Uh, wait, why? Okay, cool. Sweet. So, sorry, I, this was just revising some of the earlier concepts. Um, okay. So, we're going to be exploring the structure a bit more. This is called object-oriented programming, okay, when we have these classes. Okay, so first things first, we want to answer why does object-oriented programming exist? Okay, so I want to give you a high-level understanding of what we mean when we say objects, why is this called object-oriented programming, why has this been created? Okay, the best way I think to think about this is to think about how you see the real world. Okay, so the world outside, like the whole world, contains things. Okay, we might call these objects, right? Laptops, phones, lecturers, students, all of this stuff. Okay, all of these objects, trees, birds, etc. Okay, all of these objects interact with each other simultaneously, right? Like while I'm teaching you, um, you know, birds are outside, they're chirping at each other. Um, people in other places are eating, okay, buildings are standing, etc. Right? We've got all of these objects are doing all of these things simultaneously. Um, but y so there, there's all of these objects, they're all interacting with each other, everything's happening simultaneously. Okay. Now, in a lot of ways, this real world is the exact opposite of what computers are doing right Ex the exact opposite right so in the real world we have all of these objects they're all interacting simultaneously but unfortunately in in computers when we program we don't have objects right and they're not interacting simultaneously all we have is singular lines of code right we have 
a line of code like int x equals 3. Okay. After that line of code runs, right, that thing happens, and it's that's the only thing that's happening. It just happens. And then the next thing happens, and it'll go like x plus 3, right? So we add 3 to x. Okay. And then the next thing happens. We've just got all these lines of code that just run sequentially. Okay. So you can see that when we have this world that ha has all of these different objects and they're all interacting simultaneously, but when we program, we just have lines of code and they just run one by one by one. You could see that it would be very difficult to write code that reflects or helps us solve real world problems. Okay. So object oriented programming allows us to program in the first way. Okay. So in this way where there's objects and they interact with each other simultaneously. Okay. And this is a much more intuitive way to think about problems to humans. Okay. Rather than just singular lines of code running one by one by one, I can think about objects and how they interact with each other. Okay. So this is the basic reason why object-oriented programming exists. Okay. And the structures that exist within it are classes. Okay. So that's what we're going to be exploring in sort of this next... 45 minutes, okay, why this exists and why it's so effective. All right, so let's just um, start with a high level view, okay? If, I, if I'm a programmer and instead of programming just lines of code that run sequentially, I want to be able to describe objects, okay? Let me just actually make sure that everyone's following, that there's no questions already. Thank you. So, uh, what page are methods again? Oh, um, methods are page 34. Yeah, but we'll um, we'll discuss all of this in more detail now. Cool, cool. There are no questions so far. All right. So let's see. So I'm a programmer, and instead of writing lines of code just that run one by one by one, I want to start thinking about my code in terms of objects. Okay. So I want um, to be able to describe different objects in my code. I want to have a bird object and a tree object and a person object, etc. Okay, and I want all of these things to be able to interact in special ways rather than just thinking about them in just lines of code. Okay, so we have to think about in order to solve this problem how we can formally describe objects. Okay, so to do this, we're going to use people. Okay, so you see I have little, three little people on the screen currently. Okay, we've got three people there. Okay, so we can consider these three objects. Okay, we can consider these people three objects. Okay, um, the people can have different hair colors. Okay, for example, there's, there's a bunch of ways that different objects can um, sort of change themselves. Okay. Um, sort of be described, right? Different people have different qualities, we could say, different attributes, different properties, okay? Different people have um, different things about them. They're all people, okay? All of the people on the screen are people, but they, you can see in this case, they have different hair colors, okay? We've got someone with blue hair, someone with blonde hair, someone with brown hair, okay? Cool. Likewise, they can have different heights, right? So this person is 1.8 meters tall. This person is 1.6 meters tall. This person is 3 meters tall. They're all still humans. Well, this person on the right is maybe a giant, but the point is, let's they're, they're people, okay? So they're all just people still. They just have different qualities, okay? They've now got different hair colors and different heights. They can also have different weights, Okay, this person can be 70 kilograms, this person can be 75 kilograms, and this person can be 200 kilograms. Okay, so here we've got three people, and each of them is described by three properties. Okay, so all of them are people, they're identical, other than the fact that they have these three properties that they can vary according to. Okay, so person one has blue hair, okay, person two has blonde hair. They're both persons, both people, but they're different along this one property, this one attribute. Okay. Cool. So we can give them names, right? So the one on the left is person one, the one in the middle is person two, the one in the center is person three. Okay. So now we have a way to refer to them that's very consistent, right? 
person number. Okay, it's so your person one, your 1.8 meters, 70 kilograms, blue hair. Okay. Cool. So now we get to this idea of what a class is. So this is what a class is. This is what it's describing. Okay, so we have person. This is this capital P. Okay, person, capital P. They're this person class. Okay, a class of things. A class of objects. Okay, and we call it person. And in this case, we've got three different things, three different objects of type person. Okay. So they're all the same class, person, okay? And the person class, currently we can see, has three properties, okay? Blue, your hair color, your height, and your weight, okay? But we'll see that more, okay? So the important thing so far is that, you see, all of these people inherit, or, no, let's not use that word. They are of type person, okay? All of these people are of type person. Okay. That's that's what we're trying to get across. They're in the person class. Okay, so hopefully we can see that. So we've defined this one thing. We've defined a person and from that person we've defined several different objects. Okay, but they're all of the same type. Okay. And and this is the primary primary divide. If you understand this, you kind of understand the basis of object-oriented programming. Okay, we've got a class person, and inside our class, or of our class, or from our class, we can create objects. Okay, as many objects as we want. Here we've got three, but you could see I could easily create a another person, right? And they could have their own hair color, their own height, and their own weight. Okay. Also, if I wanted to add another property, like if I wanted to add um, your, I don't know, any, any any other property, like eye color or something, then we can just add a property to person, and then all of these objects, all the person one, person two, person three, they would suddenly all also have that property. Okay. Cool. So this is this is the basic idea of objects. Okay. This is what we mean. Um, Another way of saying this is that objects are instances of a class. Okay, they mean the same thing. So, um, if if in a test, in in like a, a multiple choice, they can they can use the word instance of a class. So they can say instances. That just means the same as objects. Okay, why do they also use the word instances? This word actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, the reason they use that word is because they're saying in this instance, okay, in this instance, person one is representing the person class. Okay, so in this instance, when I refer to the person class, I could refer to person one or person two or person three. Okay, so you can see it kind of means the same thing as objects. Okay, so we can say objects are an instance, an object is an instance of a class. Okay, an object, an object is an instance of a class. So in this instant, this object represents this class. Okay. So here's a class of type person. We could also have defined birds or trees or anything else as easily, right? They would just have different properties. Okay, trees could still have height. They probably wouldn't have weight. They might have like leaf color and bark color, etc. Okay. Cool. So we've got instances. Okay. <clears throat> right, these instances, as we've discussed already, have different properties. Okay. So here's an example of a property. All right. If I if I asked you person one dot height, what would you tell me? Person one dot height. How how would we answer that question? We would go, okay, we've got a whole bunch of different objects. Okay, person one, person two, person three. You're looking for person one. Okay, so we would go, okay, this is person one. Okay, here they are. And we're looking for dot height. Okay, that's right here, right? That's 1.8 meters. Person one dot height is 1.8 meters. If I asked you person one dot hair color, hair color, what, what would your answer be? You would look through all of our objects. This one is person two. Okay, person two. Person two dot hair color. Okay. What is person two's hair color? Blonde or yellow or whatever. Okay. 
person three dot wait. Okay, we would go look at our objects. Okay, this object is person three. What is their weight? Two hundred kilograms. Okay, and I could ask you a bunch, right? I could say person one dot hair color, or person three dot height, right? And all of these questions you can answer just from this simple structure. Okay. The other important thing is that we can guarantee every single person has these properties. Okay. So these these are all they always exist is basically what we could say. All right. Cool. Another thing we can have, so our objects can have properties. Okay. So that would mean that we defined inside our class we defined a person as something having a weight, a height and a hair color and we could have defined any number of other things um, but we could also in our class define methods okay so what do we mean when we say methods this would be something like this okay so um, people well objects can't just have things okay they they do have things right properties and attributes like have qualities if you like but they can also do things okay so our objects don't just exist with certain qualities they can also actually do things act okay those actions we define in methods okay so for example if I told you person one dot run you might expect something like this right someone with blue hair who's 1.8 meters 70 kilograms running Okay. If I told you person 3 dot run instead of person 1 dot run, you'd expect someone with that hair, okay, brown hair, who's 3 meters tall, 200 kilograms running. All right. So we could we can easily change this. Okay, we have these different objects. They all the person class would have this method called run, and all of our objects could just use that method. It could just go, okay, person 2 dot run, person 3 dot run. All right. Okay, so this is how we describe objects. Okay, that is that is basically it. Actually, there's a bunch of technicalities. Okay, that we're going to go into, um, at least start going into throughout this lesson. But this is the basic of basics of what a class is. This is what we mean when we say class, when we say object. Okay, um, a class defines a set of properties and methods, and all of the objects of that class have those properties and have those methods, but they'll change slightly. Okay. Cool. So I think let's go into doing some examples now. Let's see. Okay, no questions so far. That's good. Um, yeah. Cool. So I think let's create, let's create a class and see how this actually works. Okay. So... Hmm, let's see. In in your book they use they create a class called rectangle. Do you want to do that one? Um, we can we can create a class called rectangle or actually no I think it'll be better. We might explore that next week. But this week let's create a person class. Okay? So we're gonna create a class exactly the same as um as the one I just showed you in those slides. Okay, so we're going to create a class called person. It's going to have three properties. Okay, hair color, um, height, and weight. Okay, and it's going to have one method. Okay, run. The run method. All right. Um, yeah, cool. So, so let's, let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to come over to Rex Tester. Okay, I'm going to remove our little other method example that we were doing earlier. Okay, so I'm going to remove this. That's gone. I'm going to remove all of this code in main as well. Um, and we'll just... I'll just leave it for now. Okay, I'm just going to leave it empty. Okay, we'll leave it empty. And what I want to do is create another class. Okay, so I'm going to come here. So we've got public class program. Okay, you can even when I go over the 
parentheses, the curly brackets, you can see they're highlighted in green. So Rex Tester is telling me that public class program starts here, okay, and it ends here. Okay, so I'm gonna go after public class program and just hit enter a few times. Okay, give myself some space because I'm trying to create a person class here. And yeah, let's create a class. All right, so how, how would I do that? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna I basically copy this here, right? Instead of program, I'm gonna call mine person. Okay, so we can say public class person. Okay, good stop. Right, and then I have to give it these curly brackets, right, to tell it where my class begins and ends. Okay, oh, I should have put the space inside the class. Okay, let's give ourselves some space inside the class. Okay, so we are now inside public class person. Okay, now, what else do we want to do, right? We said we want to define three properties. What were our properties? hair color, height, and weight. Okay, hair color, height, and weight. So how will we represent these things? How would we represent these things? So weight, that's just an integer, right? An integer. Um, so like 100, 200, 300. Okay, we can't have a negative weight, but we can explore that problem later. Right, um, so we can just say int weight. Cool. So we've now created the property weight. Okay, inside. So now everything of type person has an integer called weight. Okay, not too bad, right? That's how you add a property. So how would I add height? And what would height be? Okay, I think height is no longer a um, int, right? We would rather store maybe height in meters, so it'll be like 1.8 or 1.7, something like that. So how how do I store decimals like that, guys? What what is the type that I would use to store like 1.8 or something like that? Anyone? Okay, so Ham says double, and that is correct. We'll use double. We also, you is right, we could also have used float, right? We could have also have used float. Um, but let's, let's stick with double. Okay, so let's say double height. Okay. Double height. Okay, so now everything of type person will have an integer called weight and a height, uh, a double called height. Okay, so they've now got two properties. What was our last property? It was hair color. Okay, hair color. So hair color is something like blonde or blue or brunette. Okay, so how would you guys go about saving hair color? What, what, do you guys have any ideas? How would we save that? A string, a string. So I'm says a string, that's exactly correct. Okay, we'll save hair color in a string. Okay, so I'll say string hair color, and I'm not going to spell hair color, color like an American. I'm going to throw the U back in there. Okay, cool. So we've created a person, and they have three properties. All right, three properties. Hair color, height, and weight. Pretty simple, right? Okay, so... Is this going to work yet? No, of course not, right? We haven't yet told C Sharp how to actually create, how to actually construct an object, okay? So what do I mean? Currently, we've told them that, okay, there is this thing of type person, a class called person, and they have an integer, weight, a height, that's a double, and a hair color, that's a string. Okay, they've got these three properties. I haven't yet told C Sharp how to actually create, how to actually construct a person. Okay, so we need to say how, tell C Sharp 
how does it create, how does it construct an actual person object from this class? So it's got this class that has these properties, but how do we actually create a new person? The word they use is construct. Okay. In order to construct a new person, okay, as you'd see on page 35 of your textbook, you're going to use a method called constructor. Okay, a constructor. Okay, so this constructor will tell C Sharp how it can take this class of person that has these properties and actually construct an object of type person. Okay. So let's let's see that now. All right. So I'm going to say, um, in order to construct a a constructor, there's basically just one special, let's say two special rules actually. A constructor has to be public, okay, because when I construct a thing of type person, I, I can't, you know, I have to be outside the class person, okay. My main method, inside my main method where I actually run my code, I'm going to be cons creating people, okay, I'm going to be constructing things of type person. So it, it has to be public because the only way I could access per, um, this constructor from main is if it's public. Okay, don't worry, we're going to explore what public and private mean in more detail in a bit. But for now, just know the constructor has to be public. The other rule about the constructor is its name. Okay. It must have exactly, so capitals and everything, it must have exactly the same name as the class. Okay, so the constructor for a class must have the same name as the class. Okay, and it's a method, so we just put the two normal brackets there, exactly like the main method has. You see it has these two normal brackets, and we throw down the two curly brackets as well. Okay, to define the beginning and the end of our method. And bam, it's that easy. We've now got a constructor for person. Okay, so when we create something of type person, um, C Sharp will now look for this constructor. Okay. But notice we still haven't told it what to do um, with the weight, height, and hair color. Okay, like how do I set a person's hair color initially? How do I, when I create a new person, how do I set their hair color? So hopefully some of you can see from our revision of methods how we're going to go about doing this. Okay. So when I want to create a new person, I'm going to have to specify a weight. Right? I'm going to have to specify a weight. That weight needs to be an integer. Okay. When I create the new person, when I try to construct this new person, it's going to go to the constructor and it's going to try to give the constructor the weight. Okay, it's going to try to give it that number corresponding to the weight. So how do I tell the constructor what to do with that? Well, like with the other method, right, we have to specify it there. Okay, so it's going to take in an integer for the weight and it's going to save it in a variable called w. Okay, and then I can just say weight equals w okay so now when I construct a new person I'll be able to give that person a weight okay let's see are people having doubts now everyone's still okay yeah we've been we're working through it pretty slowly I think so hopefully it makes sense okay so now when I construct a new person it'll go to this constructor method the constructor is going to take in an integer and save it in a variable called w and then it's going to save that variable inside wait okay pretty simple all right now what if I want to also specify a height when I create a new person well then we had, we have to tell it right how to how to do this. Okay, so height is a thing of type double. So maybe I would say something like double h. Okay, 
and then we would say height equals h. So now when we create a new person, we'll specify a weight and a height. And that weight will be saved in the variable weight and the height will be saved in the variable height. Okay. Initially, it, there's like this middle, this middle man, right? We, temporarily, it's kept in W and H, but then it gets saved in weight and height. Okay. Cool. So let's let's leave out hair color for now just to see what happens make sure that it still works and let's just create a person with a weight and a height okay a weight and a height so how would i go about doing this okay. how do we create a variable is the question i want to explore with you quickly so we would say type and then name right name it's that kind of template right when you're creating an object it's sort of the same or at least the beginning is the same we tell it what type it is what type of object are we trying to create uh, an object of type person right so we say person okay if we go back and check out the slides um, our first person ooh, sorry about that let me move this guy off the screen our first person was called person one right person one person two person three so let's focus on creating person one okay so what's their name it's person one right person person one a good start okay makes makes a lot of sense now it changes from what what creating a normal a normal variable is right so here we're creating a normal variable when we're creating an object um, it's it's slightly more complicated okay because you need to be able to update the object later okay um, and so C sharp has to save it in a special way it's not difficult they still made it very nice and easy to do but you need to specify that you wanted to construct a new person okay so we're saying we're creating this thing person one this object person one of type person but you need to tell C sharp that it is a new person okay so how you do that they made it nice and easy to remember you actually say like this is a new person you use the word new okay and you say equals new person okay person person one equals new person okay what is this this is a method right you recognize this it's got these two normal brackets after it it's it's the method called person that's right here it's our constructor what does it expect it expects an integer and a double right what what do we want to give it we want to give it 1.8 and 70 or 70 and 1.8 rather so we specify the weight that the new person will have 70 kilograms and we specify the height that the new person will have 1.8 okay and bam that will create a person okay with a weight and a height so when i run this you can see it runs we haven't done anything yet so it doesn't print anything out or anything but, but you see there's no errors. So this went and it created person one and it gave person one the weight of 70 and the height of 1.8. Okay, so that would be your first, your first class, right? So now let's say I wanna, I wanna actually see this. I wanna see the person that I created. So let me try. I, would, I, would, I wanna print out, just to double check, I want to double check that person one's person one dot weight is 70. I want to double check that this is the case. Okay. And now we will run into a new concept that we're going to have to learn. Okay. So when I run this, it, it won't work, unfortunately. So let me run this. Um, but it gives us a pretty nice error, actually, if, if you know what it's referring to. So when I run this, you see it gives us an error, and it says, P 
person.weight okay, is inaccessible due to its protection level. Okay, and now we've suddenly run into this idea of what public means. What is public? Okay, what is private? What, what do these words mean? Okay, now you see I just created int weight. Okay, int weight. If you do not specify, if you do not tell C sharp that something is public, then it will assume it is private. Okay, so for example, let me just type here private int. Okay, this is now the same as, as what we just had. Okay, because I did not specify that the variable was private, C sharp just assumed that it was. Okay, which means I am not allowed to access it outside of the class. So it's inside the class person, and if it is private, that means you can only access weight when you are inside the person class. Okay, so you see this method, person, it's inside the person class, and so it could access weight. Okay, the main method is not inside the person class, it's in the program class. So it cannot access this variable weight. Okay, in order to fix this temporarily, we can say, instead of private, let's just say public. Okay, so this now means weight can be accessed outside of the person class. So now when I run this and print out person1.weight, you can see there's no error and it prints out 70. Okay, so that's what public and private mean. You've now got got that down, hopefully. Um, so you via are you speaking about so we created height was a double, right? Double can hold decimal places. Um, weight is an int because I, we were just specifying, you know, in kilograms without decimals. So, yeah, in this world you couldn't be 70.5 kilograms, but you can be 70 kilograms, okay, because it's an int. Okay, so no decimal places. Our weights don't have decimals, but our heights do have decimals. So our height variable is a double and our weight variable is an int. Okay. Cool. So, we made weight public, and so now when I say person one dot weight in 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 this main method, it prints out seventy. Okay, that's great. If I say person one dot height, what would happen? This won't work, right? When I run this, it gives us an error. Person one dot height is inaccessible due to its protection level. Okay. How do I fix that? Well, because we didn't specify, it assumed that height was private. Right? And so I could just make height public. Okay. I can just make height public. So I can just run that. 1.8. Great stuff, right? So now, now I can access height from outside of the class because it's now public. Okay. And the same would be true for hair color. Right? If I tried to access hair color outside of the class, um, it wouldn't work okay? because it assumes that hair color is private. Cool. So we're going to be discussing this public-private thing more in a bit. Um, but for now, I think that's okay. So we've, we've, got, we've made the variables public so we can access them now. Okay. Cool. But I can also change a person's height and weight. Right? Um, so they're they're public, it's public int weight. Right? So if I print out person one dot weight, when we initially created person one they were seventy kilograms. So when I run this it prints out seventy. Okay. 
in order to change the person's weight hopefully you guys can already see how you would do this it's very simple we just say person one dot weight equals whatever you want their weight to be now so we will say 80 okay and so in the next line if I now print it out again so I say console dot write line person one dot weight okay if I do that then now it'll print out 70 because initially it is 70 and then we print it out okay then I change the weight to 80 and then when I print it out again you can see it's 80 so we get 70 80 okay so we now change the person's weight okay double check everyone's still happy Sorry, I forgot to do this earlier. Okay. Register taken. Oh, but Sachin was here earlier. I'll just have to remember. Okay. Cool. So we've created a person, we, we can update their weight, right? Let's um, now just set the final variable as well. Um, hair color. Hair color. Oh, can someone has background noise please mute? Oh, cool. Searching's back. Okay, let me screenshot again. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so let's we want now want to assign the hair color okay and we do this exactly the same way we assigned the other two things right we took an int w w h and now we're just going to take in string background noise string h c okay hair color all right and then we can just say hair color equals h c Okay, and now when we create a new person, we need to specify person 70, 1.8, and we have to give them a hair color, right? Persons, person one's hair color was blue. And it's a string, so it has to be inside the quotation marks as always. Okay. Yeah, but we also had two other people, right? So how would I create them? In the exact same way, right? I'll say person, person 2 equals new person okay um, person 2's details let's go see um, they were 1.6 meters tall 75 kilograms and they had blonde hair okay so um, 75 kilograms 1.6 meters tall blonde okay new person great um, to create person 3, person, person 3 equals new person, okay, um, their weight was 200, their height was 3.0, 3 meters, and their hair color was brown or brunette, whichever, okay. Bam, so now we've created three people, okay, they'll all they all have weights, they all have heights, they all have hair colors. And when I run this, you can see it just works. Okay. Quite, quite cool. Um, all right. We don't have too much l time left. Hmm. But I suppose we, we can start discussing this a bit more. Okay, so um, we, we won't be able to finish our discussion of private and public. Um, but we can at least explore it a bit more. So um, if I said console.write line, okay, person three dot wait. Okay, console.write line, 
person three dot height. Okay, you agree both of these would work because both weight and height are public, right? So when I run this, we'll get two hundred three point zero. Okay, two hundred three. Okay. Uh, it's just it's it, it it is a double. It's just because it's point zero. It didn't print out the decimal. Okay, and if I say console dot write line person three dot hair color, will that work? No. Right now, it's going to give us an error. Okay, it says person person dot hair color is inaccessible due to its protection level because this this is private okay it's the same as if I had said private so it can't be accessed outside of the person class cool so let's see why does this exist why did we why did C sharp decide to make public and private variables okay the obvious answer is security right you don't want people to be able to change and see everything in the class okay and and you see this this is the key so if I say public height right if I say public height it doesn't just allow me to see the person's height right? so you can see currently if I say person 3 dot height it does print out 3 I'm allowed to see their height if I change this to private I wouldn't be allowed okay, I wouldn't be allowed to see it anymore okay. but it also allows me, if I make it public, it doesn't just allow me to see it, it also allows me to change it. Okay, so I can change their height to like 2.8. Okay, and when I run this, because it's public, you see it, their, weight was, their height was initially 3.0, I changed it to 2.8, and I saw it after I had changed it. So it was 2.8. Okay, so you can see I can change the height and see it, right? If I make it private, then I can't change it and I can't see it, right? So you see now it prints out two errors. It tells me twice, person on, on line, tells me on line 20, okay, here, person 3 dot height is inaccessible, and on line 21, person 3 dot height is inaccessible right it's telling me twice because I'm not allowed to change it and I'm not allowed to see it because it's private okay but you can see there's there's a bit of a oversight here right we're not we're not sure of something what if I want to be able to see it but not change it okay how, how would I do that there's no there's no middle ground it's either I can see and change it or I can't see or change it. So how do we fix that? Okay, and we don't have enough time to answer that question now, but that's what we will begin discussing in the next lesson. Okay, how do we make it so that we can see it but not change it? Okay, so yeah, cool. I think let's call it there for today, guys. Um, Next week will be 2 o'clock again. Oh, okay. Makes sense. But I suppose you can see on your screen anyway, if you wanted to, right? Um, okay. Yeah, it was just so that I could get the screenshot with everyone inside the, inside the thing. Cool. So, yeah. Um, cheers, guys. That's that's it for today. We're ending two minutes early, but that's just because I don't want to start covering the privacy thing without finishing it. Okay, when will the the meeting be posted? Uh, you mean the the video, the YouTube video? I'll upload the video immediately after this and post both this and the previous one um, as soon as YouTube finishes processing them. So it'll probably be this evening, this sometime. And I'll also schedule next week, let's try not using Teams. I'm going to try switching to WebEx Meets. So you guys will have to create accounts with WebEx. Please do that before the lecture actually starts. Okay. So I'll send out, I'll schedule the meeting and it, it's cool. It automatically adds to your Google Calendar if you have one and it automatically handles all that stuff for you. 
So um, we'll switch to WebEx meets for next week and I'll schedule that meeting also like this evening. Okay, cool. See you next week, guys. Um, yeah, have a good one. Stay safe. Cheers. Um, oh yeah, the, the meeting will stay open until the last person leaves as usual. Okay. Yeah, cool. Cheers.